evening and welcome to this very special edition of Coffee with the Clares. It's been ages. It's been three months, I think, since our last Coffee with the Clares. And you will notice that Claire is missing. Um, Claire is actually on the comment tonight. She couldn't make it, but she's here. She not, may not be here in body, but she's definitely here in type. So if you are on any of the channels, please give Claire a big shout out. So she will be saying hello, but it will be done by text. Uh, we've got a fabulous show tonight. Um, really, really pleased to be back. As I said, it's been three months since we last saw you. Um, and so much has gone on, lots of things to talk about. Uh, if you are a regular to Coffee with the Clares, you will know it's a lovely, gentle, easy format. Uh, we like to get lots of questions from yourselves and you know, please do that. We've got Sam and Gav producing and Sam's on the questions tonight. So if there's anything interesting flagged up, Sam will be waving a question card at me and we'll go straight to you. Uh, but before we go on, as always, we would like to talk to you about the T's and C's. Remember, if you see any spammers in the comments, please don't click on them. These sessions are free from us um, and, you know, you don't want to be spending because you could watch this at a later date, still for free, on the OM System channel or the Olympus UK Facebook. So uh, welcome to everybody across the world. Uh, we are going live to Europe and to America and to everywhere else in the whole world. So that's wonderful. Thank you for joining us. We've got lots of people online at the moment. Um, so let's start the show, shall we? Uh, usually we start off and Claire and I will have a little bit of a chat, um, but I'm going to fill in and say what we've been shooting. Now, it's been three months and lots of things have been going on. We've launched the OM1. It's been a phenomenal success. Um, and actually... We have been shooting, but we haven't really had the chance to show some pictures. Now, did you know that it is insect week? So with that in mind, Claire and I took to our gardens and, and took to the streets to find some insects. So Gavin, if you could show me Claire's first picture. Now this is beautiful little, um, it's actually a female yellow dung beetle. <laughs> The only reason I know that is because we've got an expert in the house, <laughs> uh, and it's not Gav. Um, so yes, <laughs> Gav, <Gab's the laughs> sorry Gav. Um, so yes, this is a beautiful image, and this is shot on an EM1X with a 60 mil macro. Um, so look at the sharp features there. Look at its beautiful little eyes. You know, and the thing about uh, insects, it doesn't always have to be all in focus. Uh, you can use focus stacking, uh, but this has been shot as a one-off, and we love that little capture. So. Fantastic, Claire. And we'd like to see another one, Gavin, please. So this is, now I've been told quite specifically, this is not a bug, this is a beetle. I don't know what sort of beetle, um, but it's a leaf, we're going to say a leaf beetle. <laughs> I, mean, I look like I know what I'm talking about. Um, so this is a lovely leaf beetle. Again, this was shot on the 25mm f1.2. Now, we all know that's Claire's favourite lens with the EM1X. You wouldn't really think this was a sort of bug or beetle type insect sort of lens, uh, but that's the one Claire had on at the time. And uh, we loved it. Look at the iridescence on the shell. It's beautiful. So again, nice context where you've got the leaf slightly out of focus on the back end. And I really like it. Uh, next image, Gavin, please. Now this, what did we say this was called? A gatekeeper. <laughs> Keeper, this is Sam's whispering to me. Um, so yeah, this is lovely as well, beautifully in focus. Lots of these about, um, and a great butterfly um, moth to, fo to, to, to photograph. Actually, these are beautiful, um, and you know Britain's got lots and lots of species. And we're going to be talking a little bit about that as the show goes on. Um, so as I said, we've got lots to cover. I feel like I'm talking to myself here, which is a little weird. Normally, Claire's there. Um, so, yes, if you're in the comments, Claire, and if anybody's in the comments, say hello. Have we got any questions so far, Sam? Oh, you're all very quiet tonight. Maybe you're waiting for our guest. Not too long. Uh, lots of hellos. Um, so, yes. Hello again. <laughs> hey, Steph. Hello again. Nice to see you today and the Purple Emperor. Mm. Okay. With that in mind, Gavin. Can we show my images, please? Ah, 
Ah, so I did have some pictures of bugs and, and insects in the garden, but today uh, for an hour we quickly popped up to NEP, which is just up the road. And NEP is famous for wilding, but it's, almost, it's always famous for purple emperor butterflies. They are very rare in the UK. Uh, they're one of Britain's largest species. And they're black when you look at them to start. And then when you photograph them and they get the right light, they have this incredible purple color. And we uh, spent a little bit of time with a group of photographers surrounded by a uh, surrounding a purple emperor. And then Andy and I decided to go off. And literally 200 yards up the road, we found another one and we spent another hour with it by ourselves. So we did get some incredible shots. Lots of wings open. Uh, Steph will probably like, what? Um, and we did have some uh, a great time. We stayed and photographed it for about 40 minutes, I think. Um, beautiful species if you ever get to photograph them. Thanks, Emily. Emily says, what a cool butterfly. Yes, it is. So next picture, Gavin. Same picture, same, same, same butterfly. Uh, again, we're just taking a little bit of different versions with it. But can you see the colours? I mean, they're literally about sort of not quite a, a hand span, but they're, uh, they're, they're about this sort of wide. So they're, they're quite big for a UK butterfly, obviously. Uh, Non-native butterflies tend to be a bit bigger, but these I thought were quite big. Megan, thank you very much. She says it's absolutely gorgeous. Hope you're well, Megan. Lovely to see you and glad you've dropped by. Last image from me, Gavin, please. <clears throat> So this is exactly the same purple emperor, but a side view, and you love this because you can get much more detail. And of course, they still look fantastic, but completely different coloring under side and under the wing. Um, so from a distance, you may not even notice it's a purple emperor if you're not what you, if you're not sure what you're looking for, um, because as I said they've got a, a real variety of color, black and the browns and the and the fawns underneath. Um, but I love this uh, lay down on the floor. A nice sort of flat shot. Actually, I used the articulated screen on my EM1X to get this. I was shooting with the 40 to 152.8 and a two times converter. So at a lovely long distance away, but I like the way the background, background's been thrown out. And um, really great and interesting and fun if you get a chance to photograph them. So that's what we've been photographing. Okay. Um, so what are we here for tonight? So um, as you've seen on the titles, you know, slime mold, insects, it's national, national Insect Week. So it's all about lots of things, macro and micro macro. So I am going to introduce you to Andy Sands. He is a fantastic photographer. He's been a professional photographer for many, many years, been a friend of mine for many years, specializes in wildlife, British hedgerow, insects, bugs, focus stacking, you name it. Um, so why don't we get him on? And by the magic of Gavin Hoey, we are now back. Now, I'd love you to introduce you to Andy. Andy, thanks for coming tonight. No problem. Thanks uh, for having me. We, yeah, honestly, how long have we been saying that we're going to get you on Coffee with the Clares? Oh, I'll give you years. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been quite been, a long time. It's been a while, yeah. Yeah, so. and uh, Andy is a fantastic photographer. Um, honestly, uh, a fantastic photographer. What sort of photography do you do? Tell the public what you do. Generally, British wildlife. Um, I've been photographing British wildlife for the well, best part of 30 years, I should, I should think now. Um, obviously a lot of birds and mammals and, and, and all things, but my true passion has always been macro, um, particularly in insects and, and recently in the last two or three years, slime moulds and 
and even smaller things have come into the fray. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've got to tell you a story. A couple of weeks ago, I was at Andy's. Uh, Andy has a, a camera shop in Chiswick called Chiswick Camera Centre. And we left the building and in Andy's electric box outside was a whole nest of bees. Now, I was like, oh, gosh, Andy, right in there. Right in there with his camera, literally inches away. So, you know, he's not only a great photographer, the, you know, like I said, with any of the passions that you do about photography, mm. actually having inside knowledge and learning mm. about what you're photographing is quite important, isn't it? You know, yeah. to understand behaviours and things. Yeah, I think so. I think um, a good knowledge of a subject helps a lot with photography. I mean, a, a large part of my photography is, is being able to find things, being able to know their behaviours and, 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 and get close to them in the first place. Um, yeah. Yeah, the photography comes second, really. But, um, and but, yeah. you travel up and down the country. You yeah. every every sort of spare minute you go up to Teesdale. Pretty, pretty much all around Wales. the country. Yeah, Teesdale, Wales, all, all around the country. But I do a lot of stuff locally, particularly the last couple of years because um, I haven't been able to Lockdown. travel. But um, so we, we did a lot more locally last last two or three years. Um, and it, it's it's surprising. It, it it taught me something, and it was quite interesting being stuck in and, and, and local and just walks from the house of how much there is to photograph, particularly macro subjects really close to home. You don't have to go to exotic places. There's yeah. plenty of stuff. So. And this is something we massively promoted was get out in your garden, get out with a macro lens, yeah. you know, because mm. if you did other photography and you sort of felt you were desperate to do something, actually getting a macro lens and getting down in amongst the leaves and the grasses, yeah. you can find a lot more. Well, a macro lens is the best lens in your kit bag. There is always something to photograph. Doesn't matter what the weather's doing, doesn't matter if you're stuck inside, outside. There's always subjects to be found with a macro lens. So I love it's, that. It's, it's a great lens. So, so uh, before we talk about kit and setup, which there is a little bit to talk about, um, tell us why you shoot shoot Olympus OM systems. Tell me, tell me the story. Well, I mean, I know the story. Well, well that'll be your fault, Claire. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's I, my fault. <laughs> for, for many years, for well over 20, 25 years, I was shooting on a, a, a popular full frame, high resolution uh, camera system. Very happy, getting good results, and, and, and had no issues with it. Claire came along to the shop with a bag of kit and said can you take this and play with it for about a month and just give us some genuine feedback on how it compares to the system you use and what it's like for, for a wildlife photographer to use so after three months she insisted <laughs> on taking it back which was you very, were quite cross weren't you i was very really cross it was very inconvenient so um and, and i bought um it was no m1 in in, in those days that's so right the yeah em1 so EM1, EM1, EM1 mark, mark II two originally and yeah. a 60 mil macro lens um, i still was using my other system as well i was using them side by side then i bought the 300 mm f4 pro lens yep and then i found more and more i just wasn't using my old kit um, that's right a big chunk of it was was down to quality i, I was skeptical at first with a micro four third sensor i'll be honest um, as to whether i'd get the quality because i supply a a big picture agency. I like to do big prints for exhibitions and the like. Um, yeah. And I was concerned I wouldn't get the quality. So, well, and this is um, the one thing, the difference mm. between photographers mm. like yourself and mm. other photographers that probably mm. don't know about the micro four thirds is a lot mm. of people they shoot and it's just, they just look at them on the computer, right? They're just on their Mac yeah. or their PC. Yeah. Whereas you do prints, you sell to libraries. Yeah. And they have so, to be, they've got to be of a decent they've, they've quality. They've got to be the right quality. And um, I mean, I, I, I've bought prints along. Yes. I'm, going to, I'm going to bring some prints bring in just to just the equation. But you know, I like to be able to print reasonably up to sort of A2 size. Um, I mean, and that's pretty important to me. You can't um, see. And I Gav's, soon realised running it was, um, to the to the camera now. <laughs> you I, cannot see yeah. the quality of this image. Now, this is a stacked image, right? Yeah, this is focus stacked um, with the 60 mil macro. Yeah. Um, this is a, a nomad bee, a type of cuckoo bee, um, and they sleep because they they nest in the, the nests of other bees. They sleep by locking their mandibles onto a leaf and, and just hanging upside down for the night. So first thing in the morning, if you can find one, they don't move. You can get in close, set the camera up. Do a focus stack. This was shot with 18 images and, and, and then stacked wow. afterwards. Um, Amazing, but isn't it? Very quickly, stacked or unstacked, I, I became aware of the fact that you can. There's another one if you want to see it. Yep. You, you can easily, um, you can easily produce one? pictures up to A2 straight off the camera. So stacked or unstacked without any problem at all. Let's turn In fact, I should really have. Uh, maybe later on, I'll bring one a couple of my bird pictures yep. out. Well, I've got crops, 50% crops, printed to A2 yeah. uh, to show the quality of unstacked images. And once I realised that was the case, the picture agency were more than happy with the quality. Um, I, you know, I was quite happy with the system. I, I just changed over. And the, the big key for changing over was not just the fact that it produced the quality, but the kit is about a quarter the size and yeah. a quarter the weight. So carrying around the kit 
makes life easier. I, I didn't have to go out to do macro photography or to do long lens photography. I could carry all of it in one bag very easily. Yeah. So. And I think, you know, obviously you guys who are Olympus shooters, mm -hmm. OM system shooters will know that that uh, is part of, of our USP, you know, part of why you have the mm. system smaller, lighter, uh, weather sealed, you know, and for someone like yourself who's out in the field, getting yeah. it wet again, not a, well, not, a, not a problem? Well, getting it wet, not a problem at all. I mean, it, I, I don't know if I ever told you the story. The, the first day I went out with the, the camera you lent me, we, we went to a, a place, Tugley Woods in West Sussex, and, and photographed wood white butterflies. Right. Um, and it was a fairly dull day, and there were showers forecast for the day. I knew I'd find wood white butterflies. I knew they were very photographed and they'd stay still, so I could do comparison pictures on the, the old camera and, the, and the, the Olympus. And everything was going well, and a big black cloud came over, <laughs> and the thunder and lightning started, and it started to rain. And, uh, and, and the guy I was with and me, we went and sheltered under an oak tree. And we'd been about 10 minutes, it was lashing down with rain. And he said, is that camera weatherproof? Because I'd left the camera on the floor. And, uh, <laughs> and there was a puddle about half inch deep building around the camera. I was a bit concerned, but the, I have to say, the camera still worked three months later. Was it my loan? Was so, I say, was it my loan yeah, one? Yeah, <laughs> uh, it, it, it still worked three months later. So then he just it, told it, me it, that story. It, it, it was obviously <laughs> fine, but the, the, the system I find with the Olympus cameras, they're just as good build quality. Oh, question, I've got a question. Oh, got a question. A card's been waved at me. Yes. The, the quality and the build quality and the weatherproofing is, is definitely on a par with other pro systems I've used. Okay, Sam, shall we go in for a question? Uh, for your stacking after, do you use Helicon? I don't use Helicon. Um, Helicon is a very good bit of software. I use Zarine stacker. Um, Zarine and Helicon are, are both very similar. They're probably the best two proprietary stacking pieces of software. Um, I. I just use the ring because that's what I started with, but I, yeah, both systems work very well. Thanks, Ethan. Um, I know other bigger software mm. uh, aren't as good. If you're going to do what we're going to show you in a minute, mm. um, then going for a specialist stacking software is the way forward, yeah, right? Yeah, Helicon or Zareen, they're the, they're the two good ones, obviously. And they yes, just yeah. do stacking rather than all they're the other stuff. They just focus stacking, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, so they're, quite, yeah. they're quite specific, but yeah. it does mean that what they do they do brilliantly. Yeah. That okay. said, on, on a lot of insect photography, if I'm out in the middle of the day and it's warm and insects are active, I do use the built-in stacking quite regularly. It works works very well. Yeah, it? yeah. So. Um, and obviously with the inbuilt focus stacking, you can get 15 uh, shots and then the 16th shot is the pre is the one with all the others stacked together. Yeah. Um, and obviously the joy now with uh, OM systems cameras, you've got the little line, so you shoot everything within the box, so you don't yeah. get any crop, because that, right. uh, you do lose a few percent once they're all stacked together. Yeah. Now, you might have noticed a couple of bits of kit here, <laughs> because obviously um, we're going to talk about something quite specialist. Now, um, tell us, what is slime mould? Andy, slime please mold. tell me what slime mould is. <laughs> well, slime mould, Claire, is... It, it's fascinating. You see, that's what, that's what slime mould is. Absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Slime moulds are not a fungi. They're not plants. They're not animals. They, they, they belong to a group of, of life forms called protozoa. So they spend the majority of their life as single-celled life forms, amoeba-type life forms, in organic matter and soil, feeding on bacteria and such things. Um, and then they come together into what's called a plasmodium, when you know, thousands or millions of them come together and behave like a giant single-celled creature right, that, okay. that has the you know has all sorts of amazing traits in including being able to show rudimentary intelligence and, and decision making um, and they usually feed on things like fungi in that stage and then like fungi they sporangiate they they come together they change their structure completely into a, a structure to produce spores usually consisting of a stalk a capillitium which is a net like structure that holds the spores and a peridium a skin on the top um, the average size is a, between one and two millimetres tall, so they're not exactly big. Yeah. Um, but, you know, <clears throat> modern cameras and the Olympus system and modern techniques and focus stacking have allowed me to start photographing them and other people to start photographing them in really good detail, which you yeah. wouldn't have been able to do four or five years ago. And so. I just find, you know, when I look at some of Andy's pictures, they're like little cities, little <laughs> worlds all of their own, and, and this is exactly what they are, you know, yeah. and it is very much a, a sort of micro macro setup mm. now so um let's have a quick look so something like this yeah this is um the om1 right uh, that's no, the M the, M1 this M1 is the m1 mark, mark three yep. this is the m1 mark three on this setup okay. this is a setup i use in the field quite regularly because the 60 mil macro lens which is a, a sort of standard kit lens i use a lot 
uh, is excellent and I quite often use it with, uh, with things like these. These are extension tubes. Extension tubes are literally hollow tubes that you can just stack up behind the lens. And extension tubes behind the lens will bring your point of focus closer and give you a bigger magnification. But the downside is the more tubes you put behind a lens, the more you move the lens away from the body and you move it out from what it was designed to do and where it was designed to focus. So you start to get problems after about 25 mil of extension in diffraction. You get a softening in the image. So right. you have a good problem. So what this system allows me to do, and this is a NovaFlex um, Bell MFT Bellows, which is available in, in pretty much every camera mount as well, but this is the Micro Four Thirds one. It allows me to have a bellows system so that I can move the camera in and out on the bellows, get as much extension as, as, as I want. Um, and it allows me to mount the 60 millimeter lens in the reverse position. Yeah, so can you see so, that the 60 mil is on backwards? It's on back to front. It's on back so, to front. And um, so uh, with this system, you get the rings to enable you to, to mount it back yeah, to front. Yeah, so you can mount pretty much any lens back to front. I mount the 60 mil macro back to front. It has an adapter that then bayonets onto the onto the, the rear mount of the lens. Um, yeah. Uh, um, onto the rear mount of the lens. Okay. So we've just got a message come We've up on there. We've got a vasty virus detector on our screen. <laughs> it's all right, just okay, ignore, don't ignore that. it. Okay, so we have a, so we have a um, an adapter that goes onto the rear mount of the lens. Yeah. Clip, clamps onto the back, and it carries the electronics through this cable back to the camera body. Right. That allows me to still do my focus bracketing in okay. the camera. So I can still use the inbuilt focus bracketing, which moves the focus in the lens. Um, to take my focus stacks. Right. The great thing about mounting the lens in reverse position is your focus distance is fixed at the same distance it would be from your image sensor to the rear element of the lens. So nothing changes on, on the distance. And, and then, yeah, we put in more extension, you get a bigger magnification, but you're not changing what the lens was manufactured to do or the point right. of focus. So you don't lose any quality, you don't get any diffraction softening at all ah, with okay. a setup with the lens in reverse position. So it's a much better way of having your lens set up for macro photography. So obviously so. It's, it's quite a big setup. If you've got any mm. questions for Andy, get them in the comments now, mm -hmm. um, because as I said, there's quite a lot to, to look at when you look at this sort of setup. Um, we're going to show you another setup in yeah. a minute. And we're going to show, oh, we've got a question, Sam. Uh, Mike Martin says, love the OM gear, but how does Andy find his subjects? I rarely can only find any critters when I go out early in the morning. Um, if you go out early in the morning, you're looking for insects at dawn, it's just a case of searching for them. Um, knowing where insects roost at, at night is a, is a good way of starting. I mean, if you're going to go out at dawn, you can look for critters early in the morning, work out where the sun rises and sets. If you've got a field, go to the area where the sun will be on the field last thing in the evening because all of the insects will migrate to that end of the field they'll be there in the evening you'll find a lot more where the sun was the night before the other thing is go out at half past eight nine o'clock the night before and just watch things watch butterflies and damselflies and things see where they go yeah see right. where they land okay um, as for slime molds get a pair of strong reading glasses a magnifying glass and a torch and, and crawl around under holly bushes for for hours on end. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. I, <laughs> I mean, uh, Andy showed us uh, some earlier, and it is literally just a holly leaf. It was just a holly leaf, but it's only when you get a, a, a proper magnified, illuminated loop and look through it that you can actually see the slime mold on there. Question, <laughs> oh, next question is, Ethan, one last question. Have you tried using the MC20 teleconverter with the 60 mil macro lens by coupling them together with the 60 mil Kenko or Pixo extension tube? Yes, I have. Um, I mean, obviously the, the converters won't go onto the macro lens because the elements clash, but if you put a small tube between, that works quite well. And that does give you a, a bigger magnification. Um, there's not a lot of loss, because the quality is quite good, but there is always a loss of quality of a converter because you're just magnifying the center of the optic. Um, I prefer a system like the Bellow system because you the do get image. better quality and you can get a much bigger magnification that way as well. Yeah. So. I mean, it looks fantastic, doesn't it? <laughs> um, it's quite a bit of a setup, isn't it, guys? Yeah. Um, you know, so. That's but my as sort I said, of outdoor setup. Yeah, so. exactly. But you saw the uh, the slides that uh, we were looking at in the as we were introducing Andy and in, and in the presentation as well. And mm. this is the sort of thing we're looking at. So. 
Let's have a couple of look at, let's have a look at some images and then we'll mm. go over to the live camera that's in front of us. So, yep. Gavin, can you run some image? Oh, I love this. Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. so firstly, what's, what's it laying on? What's the... the so, the... well, this is the, the spike of a holly leaf. Ah! So these are Dididium squamulosum. They're a very common slime mould and, and particularly common in leaf litter and on the holly leaf litter in the winter. So right. Okay. Get under holly bush in the, in the winter. They're quite easy to find because they're fairly pale colours, so they, they stand out as well. They're around a millimetre tall, and as I say, they're on the spike of a holly leaf. And that's shot with this sort of setup with the, the bellow system in place, reverse the lens, and just clamp the leaf up with a little pair of um, locking tweezers and just done it outside with natural light in the woods. And how many shots is that? That will be, with the bellow system, around about 25 to 30 shots. Okay, so not as much effect. as I thought not for this one. Not as bad with the bellow system. When you work with the bellows reversed, you actually get away with less pictures. Right. If you work with extension tubes, you get a considerably greater effect of the image getting smaller as you go through, and right. that would take around 60 shots Wow. with extension tubes. Another okay, question. another question, Sam. Question is... Kieran says, do you need use any lighting equipment? Uh, you can do. I mean, the shot we're looking at on screen and a lot of my pictures are just natural light. I prefer natural light. Um, I will occasionally use one or even two small LED panels just to put a little bit of light in. Um, more often than not, if I use any supplementary lighting, like might well have done with this one, I'll use my sandwich wrapper, which is a bit of tin foil, and I'll just bend it into a sort of curve and, and tuck it under the front of the lens so it's just popping a little bit of light back up yeah. underneath the subject. And do you tend to go out and shoot <clears throat> daytime or nighttime for slime mould? Is it or is it any time? During the day. I, I go out I, on my day off every week, particularly through the autumn and the winter, but also any other time of year if, if conditions are right. I'll go off out and I'll spend the, the entire day, you know, six, seven, eight hours crawling around under a bush. <laughs> Like, I mean, doesn't everybody? Yeah, I mean, doesn't yeah, that's I, what I do on my day off. Um, <laughs> and we've got another question. Another question. Uh, Sue North, what time of the year do you find slime yeah, mould? Yeah, we cover that a little bit. Any time of the year. Um, I mean, certain species are more prevalent at certain times of year. The autumn and the winter are the best months, but any time when it's been wet. So recently we had right. some pretty heavy rain for a yeah. couple of days. Yeah. Two or three days later we went out, slime mould has started to appear everywhere um, in various places. Oh, yeah. so interesting. When conditions are damp. I mean, when the slime moulds form the plasmodium I talked about and they move around feeding on fungi, if conditions dry out, if you get drought-like conditions, they just come together into a sculotum, into a really sort of tight, hard crust, and they'll sit there for up to 10 years until they get rehydrated, and then they'll just start moving around again. No way. Yeah. Just Sorry. carry on. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So they just sort of, as they, they said, they rain, rehydrate, yeah. and off they yeah, go again. Yeah, off, off they go again. Carry yeah, incredible. It's like, so. a, like I said, it's a whole world. <laughs> okay, next picture, please, Gavin. So uh, this is just amazing. I mean, <laughs> this, the fact yeah. it's got morning well, this dew one, on it. Yeah, well, it's not morning dew, actually. This, this isn't a slime mould. This is, because um, having gone into slime moulds, when you start looking for tiny things, you start to find all sorts of tiny Other things. Other tiny so things. You're looking around on logs and bits of wood, you turn bits of wood over and you see what looks like a, just a little bit of a white smudge a few millimetres across. When you get in with a magnifying glass, you realise that it's a whole group of little cup fungi. And wow. these are lacnum fungi. This is lacnum niveum, uh, which is a tiny cup fungi. This one was shot on the setup that we're going to show you a little bit later with a, a microscope objective uh, back at home. So right. I brought it home and, and photographed it with a microscope objective. Uh, and this is shot with a 10 times microscope objective. And this is focus stacked from over 200 pictures. So this is a bit of a Whoa. different ball game. So. And again, why you mm. would take this home, because it's mm. a more of a controlled environment. It's a leaf that you can pick up or Whoa. a stem that you can pop in a box. Yeah, when, and when you get into this sort of size subject and, and the little globules of liquid just, just form on the hairs on the underside, and actually, to, to the sides, there's little zoom on got of fungi to the sides. Yeah. That's a different kind of fungi that's even smaller. Wow. But when you get into things this like big trees. and you're photographing with a microscope objective on an automated rail, you know, at the 10 times objective, your depth of field is about 4 UM, about 4 one thousandths of a millimetre. So UM so is a thousandth of a millimetre. UM is one thousandth yeah. of a millimetre. So yeah. 4 one thousandths of a millimetre depth of field. So you have to move the camera on a specialised rail probably two one thousandths of a millimetre between shots. What? And then you have to make the picture up from over 200 <laughs> images. So you can't do it 
yeah. in the wall. You yeah, this, this is, this is again, it's a specialist it. subject, yeah. isn't it? This isn't yeah. something you, you can get just wander down to around. This and size, you have to, you have to bring them over. 25 images, <laughs> yes, stack them in the wild. Yeah. But like you say, this is so more specialist. I love this image. <laughs> uh, we Well, we love them all. Um, yeah. Any more questions? Keep them coming in. We will talk a little bit more about them. Oh, Ooh, Sam's <laughs> waving. Um, in the wild with Frank Williams. Oh. Question for Andy. On a shoot, how many shots will you take? Will you shoot in electronic shutter or mechanical? Always electronic shutter. Yeah. Electronic shutter is critical because vibrations are your biggest enemy with macro and extreme macro photography. So electronic shutter, you get no vibrations, so, so you get much better results with electronic shutter. On an average day out, you know, focus stacking, doing slime molds, I might come back 4,000, 5,000 pictures on a day. Wow. And that's a good day. And then I need a week to process them. <laughs> Okay, let's have a look at your next image. Thanks for that question, Frank. Let's have a look. Uh, Gavin, please. Now, I love these. I mean, mm -hmm. look at the iridescence. I yep. mean, they're just... Has that one, has the skin broken yeah. so what's and happening? blown up? These are Lamproderma scintillans, or scintillans, one of my favourite slime moulds. You find these on, on leaf litter, particularly under holly bushes, but occasionally very tiny twigs as well. We're going to look at some live. Yeah, we're going to look at those later. in a minute. Um, they're wonderfully iridescent. Beautiful. Um, they stand about one millimetre tall. And what you can see, the iridescence on the skin, the peridium, on the one on the left-hand side of the image, the skin has started to break open, fall away, and you can see the capillotium, which is the, the net-like structure inside with the spores, uh, and you can actually see spores around on the little tiny yeah. tiny twig. So again, photographed in the studio yep. with the microscope set up, we're going to look at. I absolutely love those. Um, if you like what you see, give Andy some love and uh, tell us in the comments <laughs> what you think of the images. Um, we're getting lots of love and lots of uh, nice people liking the images. Sam, Gav, I can't see the comments today, <laughs> but I can see we've got lots of thumbs up in the corner. Um, and I know. So again, just quickly before we go to a question, if you want to follow Andy um, on Instagram, it's at Andy Sands Photography. Mm -hmm. uh, Andy does workshops um, yeah. and that would be on uh, Andy Sands .co.uk yeah. um, and uh, there again you can do workshops Andy is, an, mm. is a brilliant photographer and there are many of our uh, end users have been out with him uh, sort of getting the uh, some practice and some ideas about how you do this you know theoretically because mm -hmm. actually all looks a bit complicated but once you can go out around you on yeah. one of his workshops it they they pretty it's pretty much do that um a question sam what did you have thomas says is all of your macro photography done with tripods or have you ever shoot handheld i try to use a tripod where i can so with all the slime mold and fungi photography early morning photography a tripod you might as well use if you're going to try and do it properly use a tripod use a cable release etc um, when I'm out during the day, I just go out shooting during the day. I shoot handheld, which I do a lot. Um, that was one of the great advantages that I found out very early on of the Olympus system is the stabilisation yeah, system. Yeah, the image The image stabilisation system. system compared to my old full frame kit just makes life much easier to be able to get shots out and about handheld. Uh, and actually, I, yeah, I've been getting into more and more and more focus stacking handheld now yeah. um, out and about, and it works very well. And of course, with the new, uh, you know, with the new RM1 and with mm. the new sensor and with all the new bits yep. and pieces, that has just jumped again another yeah. another level. No, I've it? been the new using that recently, and I've got to say, it is much quicker. It's it's better still. It's another step up. So, yeah, which is exactly. Good. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, so keep your questions coming in. Um, we have got a couple of more images to look at, have mm -hmm. we? Yes, Gav's giving me the shake, <laughs> and then we can have a look at our. Now, this is one of my favourites. Do you know why I love this? I love this because obviously you've got pin sharp at the front, and then they. They just fall off into you can see what they are perfect f f number perfect <laughs> uh, stack and i just love this tell us about yeah. this image yeah so these are uh, physerum slime mold and um, probably physerum alba i mean it's difficult to say without cracking them open and looking under the microscope oh, okay but um but yeah these were on the underside of a, of a of a small log i turned it over there was a patch of them very small patch you know again they're around a millimeter tall um, and they had little globules of, of moisture that had, con had formed on them. So I flipped it over, got in nice and close, did a focus stack. I think this was with extension tubes. I think this right. was before I got the Novaflex oh, bellows. Oh, OK. So this would have been with three extension tubes, 60 millimetre macro lens, and then the focus stack would have been from probably 60, 70 images because the focus, you know, Wash. to get the, ex you know, to get the depth you need. Um, and, and, yeah, yeah. and the thing is, with this type of photography, mm. it is about a, being a little bit slower, a little bit more methodical. Yeah. 
a little bit more taking your time, getting the stuff set up rather than just running around. Because obviously the other thing yeah. about us is when you're free and tripod free and mm. you've got lots, you know, you do tend to, like I do, mm. you know, go everywhere <laughs> without it. But actually when you want to do something this specialist, it is about slowing down, yeah. thinking about what you're doing um, yeah, and, and making a well, shot. So I've got a question. How many slime moulds are there in the world? I mean, the millions. Well, it is around about a thousand named species at the moment. But oh, probably, okay. a, probably a lot more. Um, I mean, one of the, the fascinating things about slime moulds is an awful lot of the species are cosmopolitan. So right. you can be in Tasmania, Australia, North America, England, you'll find the same species in oh, different parts of the world. Oh, interesting. So not always, but a lot of the species are, are all around the world. So you can find slime mould near you. They're not. They're not specific to to the UK. Yeah. Um, Sam, another question, please. Um, Alex says, "Awesome, but what lens do you use the most? Have you used the live ND filter?" Yeah, I, mean, I use sixty mil macro lens. Is the lens I use the most. That stays on the camera most of the time, to be honest, for my photography. And the three hundred f four is, is the other lens I use a lot for macro as well as for long lens photography. Yeah. I have used the live ND filter, not for the sort of macro photography I do. Um, we did a trip, well, I'm trying to think where it was now, with COVID, probably a couple of years ago, might have been last year, uh, to Yorkshire and Derbyshire, and I did some waterfalls, used the live ND filter, works brilliantly, works, yeah. works really well. So, I absolutely yeah, love the I've live got to ND. I was quite amazed by it. So, I know, it's, yeah. it's that new sort of style of computational photography, which yeah. has actually become a genre because everything is so processor driven mm. and electronic driven yep. that, of course, then you know what you can do on Olympus cameras that you can't on, on OM system cameras mm. that you can't do on other systems, um, mm. live ND, yeah. um, you know, it, it, and things like live composite. Yeah. They're just well, that's all about it's the process. It's off subject a bit, but in Derbyshire, uh, this um, waterfall, I stood patiently while a, a chap with a large full frame system spent ages and ages and ages setting up and putting various different graduated filters and ND filters and things in front of his camera <laughs> on a holder. I know. He probably spent 40 minutes and he got his pictures and he moved out of the way and he said, oh, really sorry, I hope I wasn't holding you up. I said, no, not at all. And I, I just walked up, leaned down, didn't even use a tripod um, <laughs> and, 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 and did a shot on the 12 to 40 on the handheld ND and he went, oh, yeah. <laughs> what, 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 what did you get with that then? And I sort of showed him on the back of the camera and he, he nearly fainted, you know, you can believe it. So uh, we swapped details and I, I emailed a full resolution image to him and uh, I believe he changed systems a few weeks later. There you go. I mean, <laughs> it's amazing, right? Uh, we've got a question. question, Sam. Uh, Edward, if you were using in-body focus stack on a horizontal image, where do you put the first focus point? Okay, the in-body focus stack. So the in-body focus stack, you focus in the centre of the image and then what it will do is it will jump to forward and it will work back through where you focused and the same distance beyond um, and produce the stack from that. I mean, that's one of the reasons I prefer bracketing because you start at the front and it works backwards. I know exactly where I am because occasionally with the inbuilt stacking, it doesn't jump forward Enough. as much as I expected to. But, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that's what you focus yeah. on the centre, it will jump forward and work back through um, the image. And like you say, with bracketing, you focus on the front. Yeah, bracketing, you start at the front so and it, it works back. It is yeah. different, so you need to remember that. Uh, any more images, Gavin? <laughs> <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, Gav, are you there? Are you, have, have, did we do all the images, Gavin? No, we didn't. Oh, no. the, now this is no, this completely one. different to all the others, as in, yes, you know, they this, don't look like those sort of tree mushroom type spores. No, this is, Tell us about um, this. Well, this is a slime mold. You, you'll find these in the UK, particularly at this time of year, in, in the summer, right through to the autumn. Um, whenever it's been wet, three or four days after of some good wet weather, these slime molds will appear. And this is a Stemonitis slime mold. There's lots of different species. They all raise up on these tiny little hairs, like little eyelashes, uh, and then the slime forms these sort of tubes on the top. In fact, they're quite often known as chocolate tube slime molds because as they mature, they go brown. They look like little chocolate tubes on the top. No way. They all start off as little tiny balls on the surface of wood, usually white, but sometimes yellow. They then grow up on the stems, elongate, and then they change through various stages of pink to red to brown. If they start off yellow, they go through orange to red to brown. Oh. Um, this is Stemonitis fusca, and you can see there's a, a little tiny mite, if you scroll down oh, to the bottom yeah. of the image, feeding on it. It's oh, pulled, look at that! It's pulled one of them over, and, it, and it's feeding on the edge of the slime mould. Oh. Uh, and these are the sort of ones you'll find at this time of year. And these are much easier to find because they can be quite large. Stemonitis fusca, you can see here, can be anything up to a sort of centimetre tall. 
They're a lot bigger than most slime molds. And these nice. and these ones I've seen on your Insta, they come in different yeah. colours as well. They've been orange ones and yeah, white ones. Yeah, as I say, ones. they'll start off white and go through pale pink and they'll get steadily darker through to different reds and then turn brown. Or they'll start off yellow and go through orange and red and brown. So if you find one, you find it when it started to develop, it's earlier, it's white. You know, stick with it, go back every 15 minutes and, and, and keep taking pictures of it. This particular one was... Uh, among a group of about 10 I found on one rotting birch log last year and about half a mile away in the same wood I found a yellow one and I spent all day seven hours going backwards and forwards <laughs> between the two photographing them because they kept changing colour because they change wow. colour very rapidly through the day so I was backwards and forwards like a yo-yo changing you Have know, you ever pictures. tried to video them? I have experimented with some time-lapse videos. Right, because that, I assume, yeah, would so, be the sort of... So that's the next thing the I next sort of step, you know. Put some time-lapse you know. videos up, um, yeah. We've got a question, Sam. Yeah. And the question is, Emily, hey, Emily, how are you doing? Makes me want to learn more about slime. <laughs> Any books or websites Andy recommends? Also, does Andy use the 30mm macro? I have used the 30mm macro. I don't use it as much. I find it, it's a little bit too close on the focus point. Yeah, you, you, you've cut out too much light. Yeah, There's, although it is on yeah. a cashback at the moment. Yeah. Keep that in mind. It, it's, um, it's a great lens. The quality is, is, really, good lens. The quality is yeah. really good. Um, there's lots of good books on slime moulds. Um, the really detailed ones that I use with my microscopy for identification are probably a little bit above science most people's levers. A bit sciencey. A couple of hundred pounds. Ooh, <laughs> so expensive. More but than there are very, very good books. The, the best book you can you can look at is a book by a, a, a very talented lady, um, Sarah Lloyd in Tasmania. If you look up Sarah Lloyd Tasmania, um, she's got a, a book called Where the Slime Mould Creeps. Ooh. Excellent introduction to slime molds. There really, you go. Really good. So. Or you get yourself booked on <laughs> to a course with Andy. Now, Indeed. Um, I assume, uh, Gavin, is that the last of Andy's images? Andy, Gavin's just... Yes, that's the last Thumbs of up. them. Right, OK. So now we're going to have a look at this setup. Now, it is quite interesting. Gav's going to probably have to come around and do this camera. Um, so let's talk about this setup here, um, yep. Andy, this one we've got here. Okay, so this setup here, this is my OM1 camera. Let's move um, these out attached away. onto a 200mm tube lens assembly with a microscope objective on the front. That's a, a Mitutoyu 5 times apo plan microscope objective. I've got a 10 times as and well. And my microscope um, objective is the bit that goes yeah, up into the microscope the, to yeah, focus microscope onto your... Objective. Yeah. So this is a very good for micro photography because the, the Mitutoyos and several other um, apo plans are extra long working distance. So you can see that the focus distance is quite a way so is could, huge. Yeah, for a big and so it's allowing a bit of light as so well. It's very easy to get light into the image. Yeah. You can see on the little twig we've got some little tiny Lampadoma slime moulds, just yep. over a millimetre tool on there. Yep. So that's the sort of setup I use. It's all connected to a Stackshot Pro automated focus rail. Tell me so about that. The automated focus rail, it plugs into the cable release socket of the camera okay. on the side of the camera. It also has a, a sort of controller unit here that I, I've got here. Okay. Um, when it's plugged into the mains and you turn it on, the controller unit allows you to set the front point and the back point it allows you to set okay. how far to move in between shots in UM, in thousands like of a millimetre. Like a differential type thing. Um, yeah, but in thousands of a millimetre. Um, and then you set it to go. You can also set a sort of pause in between frames for the vibrations to settle and things. Electronic shutter is imperative. You need a really good sturdy tripod. Yeah, all yeah I mean, that is a beast floor. of a tripod, yeah. that one, isn't I it? I mean, vibration is your biggest problem. OK. And then you set it to go, and it takes the pictures automatically. It moves the entire setup forward you know, a, a couple of thousands of a millimetre, takes a shot, waits five seconds for the vibrations to settle, moves again, waits five seconds, takes another shot, etc., etc. And then once you've got all the pictures, can be between 90 and 200 pictures, you know, you put them all together, you produce your focus stack. So, I mean, it's a serious mm. piece of kit, isn't it? I mean, if you're going to, yeah. you know, this is a big jump up and this to is, the bellows yeah, this and is, the extension tubes. I mean, it's usable out in the field. You can get a battery pack for it because it's mains powered, but realistically i've got to it say to this, this, this is a studio job yeah, yeah. this is yeah. what i use in the studio and that gets me right in close to the, the, the slime yeah and if you can um show ang uh, that that mm. camera angle uh, again just mm. the edge of the sorry yeah. gav he's got to get up and again can, um, um i'm gonna are we gonna show uh the back of the probably, screen because yeah, we've focused just, on uh, that see the back of the screen if you can see can that can you so. see the back of the screen gav <laughs> <Gav's> <laughs> running around running around the studio with the there's the back of the screen 
Okay, I'm going to focus on that for yeah, you and just change there. the... There, there you go. There you can you see that? I've tried to focus the best I can, but with, uh, yeah. <laughs> with 14 thousandths of a millimetre depth of field, it's not yeah. good. But that gets you an idea of the size you can get. They're about a millimetre tall. So that, that's the magnification with the five times objective. I just... If you put a ten times objective, only you get twice the magnification. Wow. Uh, I mean, I just find mm. it absolutely mm. fascinating. Mm -hmm. It is a completely and utterly different world, isn't it? Yeah. Now, guys, if you are interested in slime mould, <laughs> um, apart from booking on Andy's course, we will be running a Zoom workshop in a few weeks' time. Uh, it hasn't gone up yet. Um, it's just waiting to be published um if gavin we could have a look at our brand new events page um, events are starting to go up now some of you know where it is you need to go to my olympus previously it would have been on image space uh, now you need to go to my olympus obviously we are a global global company mm -hmm. um, so there are lots of different um, events on there in different uh, languages and country countries so you need to go to events uh, which is on that top line so it says discover challenge such and such and such and then events when you click onto the events uh, the events should load yeah there you go uh, and as you scroll down you will find uh, different ones uh, for different see their top one there says park cameras imaging festival Burgess Hill with Gavin Hoey one weekend one macro lens one garden it has fully sold out but Gavin is going to be with me there on Saturday if you want to come and say hello Right, so this is where all the events are. Uh, you can see the one tonight, Coffee with the Clares. Um, you have got the option in the top box to filter um, and you can filter uh, English or macro, uh, but obviously the uh, if, if, you, if, you're in, if English is your first language and you wanna see them in English there, that's where you would filter them. Keep your eyes on that page because there are events being added all the time and there are lots of new zooms coming you can watch guys from the czech republic from spain from germany uh, from france from the nordics uh from australia there's lots and lots of things coming in so um keep your eyes on that um the usa are doing lots as well so um the events page w is starting to be populated uh we you know we have got the not the green light, but we've got the amber light to start looking at doing events outdoors. Claire and I are busy planning that. Um, so uh, there are still tickets for Geraint's uh, webinar. If you haven't, um, if you haven't booked on that, that's a really good one to go. And also we have got uh, next month, we've got Coffee with the Clares with Tom Ormerod. We're going to be doing a night shoot. So that's going to be interesting as well. Um, but keep your eyes out for the Zoom with Andy because Andy's going to do yep. an in-depth, yep. full-on, uh, you know, uh, uh, session. Um, and yeah. as I said, that's going to be going up in a couple of weeks. So keep your eyes out for that because if you want to learn more about slime mould, you want to ask questions, you want to see the setup and learn more about the technicality, stuff that we can't really show on mm -hmm. a live, uh, more about the setup and the cost and and just some hints and tips um, then definitely definitely go for that you need to keep your eyes on that yeah. okay how are we doing for time actually we've done all right for time we've Not got bad. any more questions you've got a few more minutes before nice questions coming nice in comments. um i can't see the comments but sam says there's some lovely comments andy span andy sands <laughs> was responsible for me to changing to olympus when he came and demonstrated at our camera club back in 2017. Peter, which oh, camera okay. club? <laughs> Let us know because we always like to know. Um, we uh, Andy gives brilliant camera club talks on all that. sorts of things, don't you? Yep. Um, yep. The British Hedgerow. I mean, there's there's so much. Richard Sainsbury, he's such a good photographer because he's a brilliant natu naturalist. Thank you, Richard. I'm always amazed at his knowledge. Hello, Richard. <laughs> lovely to see you. Thank you for joining us. We know Richard well. Yeah, yeah we know Richard. Lovely, well, lovely so. guy. Yeah. And uh, also an Olympus photographer. Oh, thanks, Welcome. <laughs> so uh, Frank says, I work with Andy and can say he's an amazing boss as well as he wants a, he wants a rise. <laughs> Frank's he's, looking for he's a had rise. He's had a pay rise. Or oh, i tell you what he wants. He wants his OM1 before you. Um, <laughs> no he's chance. had a pay rise. He's had a pay rise. Um, honestly, uh, lots of love mm. coming in. And a question. Yeah, keep the questions yeah, coming. In. We've got uh, seven minutes or so. Gary, how do you choose your background? Do you add your own or do you just live with the background that is there? 
And quite often I either live with the background that's there or I just use a little leaf or something in the background. I mean, that, that can be good. If we, um, if I yeah, dig please around do. in yeah, the print box. Yeah, dig around. Yeah, no, we like to look at the images. We can just get Gavin of, um, up because oh. Gavin's got to change his vocal <laughs> Excuse me, yeah. yeah Gav, so, come on, do your work. Nice face, yeah. <gasps> so if you look that. at that slime mould there, that's a, a great little slime mould. Oh, if you could see and that in the flesh, that you, just looks incredible. When you incredible. talk about a background, you see this was taken in the autumn, so the background is a beech leaf. Okay. The beech leaves go very orange in the background, you just right. get a beech leaf, sit it about an inch behind the subject. And do you again clamp it on? You go. Put the um, clamp or something? I either clamp it on with a little pair of, of, of little tweezers that clamp it on position sort of thing, but it's just behind. So quite often clamp a leaf or clamp a little bit of moss or something just That's behind got just impact, to just to create it? a background. And that That's really it, so. has got impact because we yeah. tend to always go for a green in nature, don't we? Yeah, but, but if I you love can get a nice warm background, you know, different colour background and things. It totally doesn't look like a one millimetre subject, does it? No. It just looks fantastic. Well, this is big, this one's nearly two and a half millimetres tall. Oh, two and a half millimetres. It's, it's huge, you know. <laughs> well, it's a real real size. While one, we've so. got time. Get a couple of other images couple, because no, we I mean, know the, people like to look at images. Well, and... the, the very similar ones to the ones we just looked at with the oh, microscope yes. lens objective. That's the um, those were, I think you saw those earlier yeah, anyway. That's so amazing. That's, um, and even the little Lampadoma. tiny hairs here. Yeah, look you can see all, all the detail and things. But on. you can see you can get very very good quality from a microscope objective uh, printed printed large. I mean, okay. it depends what you want to look at. There's that one printed large. Oh, yeah, there's that. What about <laughs> one favorite? of your um, well, insect um... images? And then uh, we'll wrap up and we'll give everybody a last yeah. couple of minutes. Just... So that's one of my favourite recent images. That's um... Now, that's that way up, right? Yeah, that's yeah. that way up because it's photographed on the camera. There you go, there you go. Um, so that's a bee fly, okay. um, which is a parasitic fly that lays its eggs around the, the nests of mining bees. Um, and this bee fly was photographed at dawn, went out very, very early in the morning, found the subject, got in close, photographed it with the reverse lens on the, on the bellows set up. So that was stacked from about 30 images. Um, and I like photographing it at dawn, particularly if conditions are right and you get the little beads of dew and the things, it really, really brings oh, out the quality sort of thing. The so. detail, the reflection, yeah. the <laughs> colour, you know, they absolutely jump out at you, you can't believe it. As I said, head over to Andy's mm. Instagram if you want to take a closer look um, or get yourself on one of Andy's courses or yep. on our Zoom because you are going to be uh, told and explained how to do this yourselves if you yeah. don't know already. So, um, right, so thank you, Andy. No, no problem. That was absolutely brilliant. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, if you enjoyed it, just give us a little bit of love. Say hello and say thank you because we've absolutely enjoyed it. Um, we always do a competition. We haven't done a competition for ages, but if you would like to win yourself one of these very handsome Coffee with the Clares mu mugs. Got oh, let's uh, 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 yeah, have a little close up on a Coffee with the Clares mug. Um, there you go. Claire's <laughs> got some and she will be sending them out. And they we do send them, we do ship them worldwide. Um, this month's competition, we've decided, is, isn't slime mould. <laughs> it might be next month. <laughs> we need to give you time to set up the kit yeah. and to get on Andy's Zoom. Um, but the competition this month um, is what's in your garden. And now, we, you can be as literal. It is um, Insect Week, so you could go on that. But Insect Week ends at the end of the month. And obviously, by the time we announce the competition, we're going to be out of Insect Week. But we want you just to head in your garden. Um, you know, if all these things can be found, maybe you're going to find a little bit of slime mould. You know, you don't know. Possibly, you know, yeah. maybe with uh, extension tubes and the 60 mil, you can at least find them, discover them, look for them. Yeah. Um, so that's this month's competition. It's a nice, easy one uh, as we've come back uh, to get you into the year. Um, yeah, and as I said, keep your eyes. Oh, Pavel says, thank you very much. John, <laughs> brilliant pics, Andy, thank love you. them. Uh, Terry Day, great show, guys. Thanks, Andy, Claire, Gavin, Sam. Susan, love this. Thank you so much. Summerdale in America. Um, honestly, <laughs> We've saved Andy. We've been two years in the in in the waiting, and uh, we knew he wouldn't disappoint. Um, love you, Claire. Hopefully, I'll speak to you soon. Thank you to Gavin and Sam, and to Charlotte, who's also on the back end, uh, doing all the comments. Um, we've had a brilliant time. I hope you've enjoyed it, and a big thank you to Andy for joining me. Thank you for having me. See it's you again great. soon, guys. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye.